Well, good morning and welcome to this Easter tide season, uh, the celebration of the next 50 days of Easter. Today we begin a new sermon series titled Embodied, Unbound. And I'll tell you more about that in a, in a, at some point. But so glad you are joining us and that you're with us this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, you must know a few things. Firstly, you are welcome, you are loved, you are safe, and God is well pleased with you. We continue to pray for the providence of Tigre in Ethiopia, for the people of Yemen and Afghanistan in Ukraine and Syria, experiencing injustice and oppression this very moment. And for the numerous migrants and migrant families arriving to the U.S. border, we say, Lord, your mercy is here. The roads were empty as we drove through the open highway in the state of Montana. It was the summer of 2020. We all know what happened at the beginning of 2020. And after four months of isolation and quarantine, we needed to get away. So we decided to load up the car, drive away as far as we could, visit as many national parks as possible. As we would arrive to each national park, we would get off the car and take it all in, these majestic mountains, these uh, stunning panoramic views, these crystal-like rivers and lakes, from desert to snow, from pastures to fields, from waterfalls to gusting geysers. It was all so beautiful. It was all so quiet. There is something profoundly spiritual about the whole experience. It seemed like creation was fully breathing, shall we say. And it was breathing new life into us. We knew that Six months later, well, we didn't really know this, but six months later, we would be moving to another paradise. That's Hawaii, by the way. I cannot quite explain it, but something about being immersed by these lush forests, these massive trees, the sound of wildlife, that somehow it gave me the sensation that I was surrounded by God on all sides. That somehow everywhere I looked, I saw the divine. That everywhere I moved, I sensed the creator. That everything I heard was holy and sacred. Now, I'm not sure if you've experienced any, like, anything like this in your life. It's almost like an undeniable presence. There's something about Earth, about planet, that is still breathing, still living, still healing, still growing, still becoming, as though it's being put back together. In all of my doubts of the time, my fears, my uncertainties, my ambiguities, all the things of the world seem to be what they are. Just things. Just things of this world and nothing more. Clearly, there is more to life. There is something greater and higher to the thing we call life. I titled today's sermon, Can I Get a Witness? Excla you know, an exclamation point and a, and, a, and a question mark. Today's wisdom derives from John's gospel and it presents to us the first official appearance of Jesus after he was raised. Now, at this point in the narrative, the women and Peter were the only ones who could testify of the empty tomb. And on the evening of that same Easter morning, Jesus appeared to his disciples. However, you must know, these are not the same disciples that we had known before. These disciples were rattled. They were hiding, afraid, behind closed doors, because surely seeing Jesus dead on a cross and being put into a tomb made them feel anxious and afraid because perhaps they were next. 
until Jesus comes into the room, stands among them, and offers the traditional Eastern salutation. Peace be with you. Or you may know it as Shalom. He directly shows them his wounds and his hands and his side. And then when the disciples see this, key word, when they see this, they were filled with joy. Jesus goes on to tell them three things. He sends them like he was sent by the Father. He breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, go share forgiveness with the rest of the world. But the story continues. And here is where I want to center us this morning. Someone was missing from Jesus' first appearance. His name is Thomas, one of the twelve. The disciples shared their testimony, what they saw in the appearance of Jesus with Thomas, but he didn't believe them. Does that sound familiar? Thomas won't believe unless he sees the word again. Unless he sees the nail marks on his hands, unless he touches his wounds and his side, he won't believe. So Jesus makes a second appearance a week later. Same setting, same room, same circumstances. The doors are locked. Everyone is still afraid. Jesus somehow enters the room, stands before them, and has the same greeting, Shalom. However, this time, Jesus points the conversation directly to Thomas and to Thomas's unbelief. He said, Come, Thomas, look, see, touch, feel my side. No more disbelief. Believe! Exclamation point. And Thomas sees, believes, confesses in the very moment. Because he realizes that his allegiance is to the one and only and says, My Lord and my God! Exclamation point. And see, here is where today, this morning, I invite you to open up your mind, your soul, your spirit. To allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning. This is where we bring all of our worries, our concerns, our doubts, our fears. This is where we bring all of our ambiguities, our uncertainties, whatever it is that's in your heart and in your mind and in your soul this morning, you bring it to the divine. You present it to the one who is, who was, and who is to come. To the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer. To the one who has promised to be our healer, to be our sustainer, our comforter, our counselor, our help, and our guide. So when we come this morning, we come with an intentional time because we know in this moment we can seek out the divine, the creator of all this, of this ocean, of all creation. We come to that God this morning because this wisdom is for all of those who do not believe the truth is. This wisdom is for all the doubters, all the pessimists, all the cynics, All the ones who need to see before they believe. But this wisdom is also for all the believers. All the ones who say they have already seen the raised Jesus. For the ones who consider themselves disciples already. For those who consider themselves true witnesses. This is for the ones who do not see with their eyes, but see with their hearts. And here is the wisdom for us this morning. To see, to touch, to hear. That is the direct result of a true encounter with the resurrection of Jesus. I'll say it again. To see, to touch, and to hear. That is the true result of a true encounter with the power of resurrection. And so the question for us this morning is, what do we need to see? What do we need to touch and what do we need to hear in order to believe? Because all Thomas could say after encountering the power of resurrection is, My Lord, my God. It is important to mention that Thomas was the first person to ever address Jesus as my God. Not one disciple, not one individual had ever 
spoken to Jesus in that way, this was the first time that it was done. What do we need to see? What do we need to hear? What do we need to touch in order to believe? Perhaps a deeper, deeper dive into this wisdom can shed some light, give us some hints, give us some openings. Because today's wisdom is so intimate. It really is. It's like a true, godly experience. Jesus enters the room, demonstrating his wounds on his hands, on the side of his body, his crucified body. But it was clearly also the message of being sent that this is no longer the crucified Jesus, that this is now the raised Jesus, no longer restricted by human limitations, to walk through walls. He is now in a different body, transcending space, walls, and even locked doors. This is a holistic encounter. So let me ask you, how does one get to touch the body of Jesus today? How does one get to touch the body of Jesus today? Perhaps getting in touch with one's own body can assist with that. So let's try something this morning, okay? Can you, for a moment, sit up straight in your chair? Put, the, put your back to the back of your seat, if you could. Get comfortable for a second there, all right? Just kind of try to dismiss all the distractions, the gardener, whatever else you hear. Just try to just move those distractions away, okay? Try it up now. Close your eyes. Relax your head, your neck. Relax that. Relax your shoulders. Relax your core, your legs. Your feet. Pay attention to your breathing. Pay attention to your body. Take a deep breath in and release. Take a deep breath in and release. Five, four, three, two, one. Open your eyes. What if encountering the body of Jesus feels like something like this very moment? I wonder how is it that one can see and touch and hear the power of the resurrection in 2022? Because I believe there are many ways to encounter Jesus today. We practiced something just a while ago known as passing of the peace. And I'm sure you said hello to someone, gave someone a handshake, perhaps someone uh, told you something about their week. And while that may be part of what we know to be the passing of the peace, I encourage you to remember something intentionally. That when you touch someone's hand, when you give someone a hug, it is like encountering Christ. That we share the peace as if each other is Christ. After saying, after all, when we say peace be with you, it is a deeper meaning. Essentially, you are saying to your neighbor, may you be saved from trouble. You are sharing a profound blessing with your neighbor during the peace time, so don't ever take it for granted. It is a way to encounter Jesus. How about the moment we, when we use our fingers to touch the wafer and the cup? Once again, this touching experience, when we touch Jesus, we know we are touching the divine, the Lord, the God. How about this? Earth Day was just celebrated on Friday, April 22nd. And such a day as that should remind us of our holy work that God has entrusted us with. 
to be good stewards of this earth, to care for the planet, not just because it's an environmental cause, but because caring for the earth is central to our holy Christian call. This is our home. This is the home of our children, the home of our grandchildren. This is the home of the coming generations. And we must learn to touch the earth. When you touch the leaves of a plant, the bark of a tree, when our feet touch the sand, in here in Hawaii, we do it all the time, the dirt, when we feel the breeze this morning, the air, when we see the rainbows in the sky, and feel the water of the ocean, well, that's just another way to see and touch and hear the power of resurrection. It's not too late to heal this planet. It's not too late to save this earth. Every day should be Earth Day. Do you see how this holistic experience is? To touch, to see, to hear the power of resurrection. But let me ask you this. If it's all so true, if all of this sounds so lovely and poetic, and it sounds so nice, then why doesn't everyone believe? If encountering the raised Jesus is so readily available within us, within our neighbors, through all creation, then why is this so hard to believe? And this is where I must call it out. Because the ills and the burdens of the so-called witnesses, of the believers, of the institutions who claim to know Jesus, of the believers who claim to have seen Jesus, who claim to know Jesus, who claim to be witnesses of Jesus, are the same ones that become barriers and become liars of the power of the resurrection. Thank you, please. Interrupting the view of those who seek to see, denying the opportunity for those who seek to touch, being so disrupted that those who seek to hear cannot. And see, I guess what I'm saying this morning is that as a pastor, I know I don't look very old, but maybe I do look very old to some of you. But to a pastor who has been around the block, shall we say, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard. That I, now I'm just categorizing them as barrier stories, or as painful stories, as lamenting stories. Of how the witness and the image of Jesus does not match up with the Christians and the American Christian Stories of black and brown and indigenous people, stories from Asian and Pacific Islander uh, individuals, from young parents with young small children, from young adults, college students, uh, from women, women of color, from the LGBT community, story after story of rejection, pain, and lament. And yet, we want our churches to be full of those communities, don't we? We want to see all of these young children running around, and all these young parents, and all of these people of color, and that everyone would be welcome. But yet, the witness does not match up with the witness of Jesus. Yet, the American Christian church doesn't match up with who Jesus has claimed to be. And so the inclusive love and power of the resurrection is nowhere to be seen. Because somehow, we have lost our way. We have lost our understanding of the inclusive power of resurrection. And by the way, this is not just the evangelicals or the Pentecostals or the Catholics. This is Presbyterians, Methodists, and even Lutherans. You see, this happens all around the church, all around the world. It doesn't match up. The witness and the testimony of Jesus doesn't match up with the witness and the testimony of Christians in the American Christian church. By the way, I lament to say all this. It hurts me to say all this. I don't enjoy saying these kind of things. Because I'm part of that church as well. 
but it is our role to tear down the systemic injustices, to right the wrongs of previous generations, to right the wrongs of our ancestors. It is our call to reclaim the true church of Jesus Christ, where all can come, all can come without restrictions, without barriers, to see, to touch, to hear the power of resurrection. How else will people be able to find it? I mean, it's no secret, right? Thomas stayed away from the disciples for the first and second meeting. I don't know if you caught that. We don't know the reason why he missed the resurrection moment. Pretty important moment, right? In the morning, he missed it, and then he missed the appearance of Jesus in the evening. Something was going on. But because he was not part of the community, Thomas couldn't see Jesus and couldn't believe Jesus. How many communities are missing from our churches who cannot see or believe in Jesus? The most fascinating part about Thomas is that the greatest doubter became the greatest believer. But all he needed to do was to see. You know, last week, we had nearly a thousand people come through our Holy Week service. Good Friday, more than 400 children and parents attended our service. The majority of them knew. God is so good to send us that amount of children in a Sunday, in a, in a Good Friday service. But the, the beauty of the moment is to ponder this. How many of those children and parents got to see, got to touch, and got to hear about Jesus and the cross perhaps for the first time. What if we would have said, no, <laughs> that's not what we do tonight. We would have denied them from seeing, from touching, and from hearing. How will people see? You know, it's been said that the fellowship is where Christ, where we can see Christ face to face. In this space is where we get to see Christ face to face. How will people see if we do not make room for them? How will they touch and hear Jesus if we do not invite them into our churches, into our fellowship? We need to be hospitable witnesses, inclusive witnesses that easily accept and include future disciples. How else will Jesus be the Savior of the world that begins with the current witnesses with us to testify of that authentic love? Can I get a witness? Or can I get that kind of witness? See, Jesus was the best witness of them all. He lived through it. He saw his disciples with eyes of inclusiveness. And remember, they didn't believe the women. Still, Jesus appears to them. He does not see Thomas with eyes of judgment. He doesn't see Thomas the doubter or the pessimist or the non-believer. He's not upset that Thomas needs to see. Instead, he easily accepts Thomas's doubt, meets him with what he needs. And this morning, he's you with what you need. Announces to us that blessed are those who believe without seeing. Well, that's what we call faith. To believe without seeing, to not need to understand, to not have an explanation for everything, those are the future disciples. We will not be able to fully see everything, yet we will still believe. Because it is undeniable. It is in ourselves, in our neighbors, in the trees, in the plants, in the animals, in the ocean, in the sun, in the rainbows. It is everywhere. It's undeniable. Jesus died on the cross, was crucified, and through his death, took our shame, failures, mistakes, sins, and transgressions, and gives us his forgiveness, his righteousness. Way to life and gives us liberation and freedom. For liberation, to touch and to hear the power of God. So this morning, I call all the doubters to come and see, come and touch, 
coming to you. I call all the believers to come and witness, to come and testify, to come and make room for the future to come. For such a thing, fill us with great joy. In our churches, All those communities that belong to you. You will see all of those individuals that have been rejected, made of them, will open up the heights. Let's pray.